Karim, uh, uh, today is a very distinguished uh, international day in the field of anesthesia and intensive care. Uh, we have international speakers if, uh, from uh, different countries, uh, Professor Ansari, Professor Walid Hamimi, and uh, we have Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Ashraf Tayyar as well, uh, our speakers tonight. And uh, we have the, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Webke Ackerman, uh, Professor of Anesthesiology from Ohio University. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you and uh, I'm gonna start with Professor Ansari and I'm actually so honored to introduce uh, Professor Ansari. Uh, Dr. Ansari is well, well known to all of us and is humbly teaching us and giving us every week a dose of critical care burns. And I'm really thankful to have him tonight. And Dr. Ansari is going to continue his uh, series about nutrition for critically uh, ill patients. Dr. Ansari, you can start, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Sarwat. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, our attendees. Uh, today we are, uh, we, we will continue our nutritional support series of uh, lectures. And I will just remind you what is the difference between starvation and distress hypermetabolism. Uh, uh, we speak, uh, we mentioned last in the, in the last lectures about the stages of uh, metabolism following uh, trauma. And uh, today just I want to differentiate what is the differentiation between starvation and uh, stress metabolism. In, uh, in starvation, the energy expenditure is decreased, about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, but it is increased in cases of high and high bar metabolism, it reach about 0 0.85. This meaning the patient to consume all the ingredients of uh, feeding, carbohydrates, protein, and fats, and so on. And as I told you, it depends mainly on the muscle, and so there is muscle wasting if we do not support the patient. Uh, respiratory quotient uh, in the average 0 0.6, 0 0.7 in starvation in, in uh, metabolism, in hypermetabolism or in stress, it is high, 0.85. The mediator activation is highly activated in uh, hypermetabolism. Uh, also, the patient in starvation de it depends mostly on fat and uh, on ketones, but in contrast to the hypermetabolic patient or stressed patient, he depends on mixed uh, macronutrient. Uh, gluconeogenesis is increased dramatically in stress. Also, proteolysis is increased. Protein sense is increased also in stress. Ureogenesis and uh, formation of urea and the metabolic products of protein are increased. Patient in starvation depends on, on ketone to some extent after the first week start to, or after the few days, he start to depend on his ketone formation. In contrast to uh, stress depletion depend on his endogenous macronutrient in, involving the proteins. Response to feeding after we start, restart feeding after that, there is abnormal processing of feeding and hypermetabolism, but in starvation really the patient gaining weight and uh, consumes the feeding in a normal process, not uh, forming free oxidant and so or free cytokines and so on. Uh, recommendations for nutrition support in the intensive care uh, unit. We have to ask ourselves uh, before we evaluate or during evaluation of our patient, if this patient is malnourished or will nourished, or he need urgent feeding support. Some patients in critically ill and some not so much. And when we start the, our feeding early, or we can we uh, wait for one week, and especially in well-nourished patient, no problem. How much feeding, how much calories we have to start gradually, or we have to start with full caloric and protein goals, or we prefer trophic feeds. All these are questions which we have to answer during uh, evaluation of our patient before starting writing our nutritional sheet. Uh, by what route? Enter route, parental route, or a combination, and we will see. 
a timing of nutrition support in critical illness. I think this is usual summarizing the process of uh, feeding. And as we told the last uh, time, uh, as a patient passes through three stages, ab phase or the hypovolemic phase, which persists for uh, 24 hours, 48 hours. And after that, followed by the leukocytic phase or the catabolic phase, which starts after three, four days and they persist for one week or two weeks. And after that, the anabolic phase starts. During the early stages, first day, second day, third day of admission to ICU or following the insult, we have to start gradual nutrition support. Suppose the first day we start by 25%, after that 50, second day, third day 75%, not exceeding 70% or 75%. By day four, we can complete our target and we can uh, replenish the patient with his target of calories according to our estimations. Uh, but we have also to adjust the caloric intake for uh, the non-nutritional calories. Sometimes the patients under sedation with propofol, uh, dextrose infusion, and so on. This must be calculated in the formula and calculated in the calories requirement of the patient. Uh, when feeding is reduced to prevent overfeeding due to non-nutritional calories, use very high protein. We have if you decrease the caloric intake for, to, to, for any reason, you have to increase the protein uh, target to uh, avoid muscle wasting and avoid the catabolism of the muscles. Uh, and direct calorimetry must be done every two, uh, two days or uh, two, uh, twice per week. Really, the indirect cal calorimetry is, uh, is the best one for estimating the caloric requirement, in especially an obese patient or patient on ventilator. So it gives me, to some extent, uh, the more accurate uh, estimation of the caloric requirement. After that, after the uh, flow phase or leukocytic phase, uh, more than four, uh, five days, uh, after that, the post-ICU phase. Post-ICU phase, don't be a hurry in extubating your patient. Really, we saw many patients suffering from malnutrition during this phase because he's suffering from uh, uh, dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, uh, no desire for feeding, and, and, and this decrease the, require, the caloric intake and such in this period in post ICU. Uh, in, uh, in contrast, we have to increase the caloric uh, supplement or caloric, uh, caloric uh, nutrition to 125% and uh, 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 average about 30 calories per kg per day. Also in the anabolic phase, in the post charge to home, we have to follow our patients and we have to increase the calories. Even we, we reach to 35 or 40 or 45 calories, a kilocalories per kg per day. Also protein must be increased from 1.3 here in this stage of flow stage or leukocytic stage to up to two and two and a half gram per kg per day. Uh, about uh, how much we prefer in the early days to give trophic feeding. Trophic feeding is small feeding, 20, 30 mils. Instead of keeping the patient fasting, we have to start feeding by small doses and going up uh, gradually. Uh, in most high-risk patients, a metric score more than 5, 6, providing we have to provide at least 60 to 80% of caloric uh, goal recommended at day 5 or day, uh, day 4. But take care, in malnourished patients, you have to start gradually to avoid refeeding syndrome in which there is a, a, the patient manifested by hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, and hypotremia, and suffering from arrhythmia, and even uh, some patients uh, uh, develop severe ventricular arrhythmia from the refeeding syndrome. And also, if you find your patient suffering from hypophosphatemia, you have to investigate your patient before starting any feeding formula. Uh, by what route uh, I have to start, enteral or uh, parental nutrition? Really better to avoid parental nutrition, especially in the first few days, especially in the first week. But suppose your patient is malnourished and there is absolute contraindication to enteral feeding, you have to supplement them by parental nutrition. 
Uh, about nutritional support in any patient in the ICU, there are several routes for supporting our patients. Yeah, the in enteral route or oral route is the best one, or the natural route. We have to start with that. So, uh, nasogastric through nasogastric tube, nasodurinal tube, uh, nasogenal or oral. Uh, or, or using the oral route, and they take care from any complications of inserting your feeding tube. Because some patients may be uh, intolerating this tube, some tubes are causing some mechanical problems like bleeding and, and so on, and others may be a uh, false passage through the lung. And so after inserting your tube, you have to confirm. And even before before each feeding formula given to the patient, you have to confirm the position of that tube through so, uh, either stethoscope and uh, hearing the sounds of uh, injection of the feeding formula, or through, if you're not sure, through the x ray or ultrasound. Also, this is a parental, uh, parental route or TPN or partial or uh, peripheral PN uh, through any central vein which is the uh, TPN. In uh, peripheral parental nutrition, you can give through uh, formula through the peripheral vein, but you have to keep the osmolarity of the formula less than 900. With more than 900, it will cause thrombotic complications in the vein and will predispose to venous uh, thrombophobitis and maybe thrombus formation. And so you have to be oriented with these complications, which could be occur uh, following TPN uh, uh, nutritional support. Uh, we can also, in some patients, uh, like patients who will stay on ventilator for a long period of time or, or uh, we will persist in the ICU for a long time, we have to decide to make or proceed directly to gastrostomy or jejunostomy or jejunostomy as a feeding uh, route for supporting because he will need nutritional support for long period of time, for long time, and so better to make a surgical ostomy for him for feeding group. Uh, also about enteral nutrition, sometimes we can't push all the formula or our formula through the enteral nutrition and we have to decrease the uh, calories uh, infused in some situations like hypothermia, in cases of hypothermia, in patient uh, accepting increased enteral abdominal pressures and uh, uh, starting uh, to complain of increase uh, about to enter to compartmental syndrome, we have to decrease our enteral nutrition or stopping it if the patient, if the pressure is high. Also patient with acute liver failure, we have to uh, decrease the amount of feeding of enteral feeding. But you can start early enteral nutrition, it can be performed in, in, in many situations like in ECMO, in traumatic brain injury, a stroke uh, in the spinal cord injury, in severe acute pancreatitis, gastrointestinal surgery, abdominal aortic surgery, abdominal trauma uh, with, uh, when the continuity of GIT is intact, in patient receiving neuromuscular blocking agents, no contraindication to start your enteral formula. Uh, in prone position, you can give, but try to, uh, to avoid aspirations and abdominal distension and so on. And you, with the help of prokinetic agents, I think you can uh, manage those patients. Also on open abdomen and if, uh, don't depend on presence of bowel sounds or not, uh, not significant, you can but avoid any bowel ischemia or obstruction and you have to stop here your nutrition support. Uh, we start to individualize the nasogastric enteral nutrition in ICU, in all ICU patients within 48 hours. We have to start our nutritional support. Uh, set uh, energy target at uh, 20 kilocalorie per kilogram per day. And even in the first one, two, three days, we can go with only trophic, uh, for a trophic uh, amount, uh, just 20, 30 ml uh, per, per hour. Uh, also set protein target also 1.2 gram and go up with protein uh, following uh, the following day. Select the tube uh, feed and the start feeding. About gastric residual volume in target and the or limiting one is 500 ml. 500 ml. Uh, uh, 
sorry, uh, advance by uh, four daily steps of 25% to meet the target on day uh, four, uh, five. Uh, only consider uh, parenteral nutrition in cases of impaired enteral nutrition or the patient is severely malnourished and needing more nutritional support. Calculate the uh, caloric requirement. How to calculate the caloric requirement for your patients? You must know first what is the basic energy expenditure and what is the resting energy expenditure. Resting is a patient is awake, basic patient is sleepy and, and fasting. And also you must remember, you know, there is diet induced thermogenesis about 15% and physical activity inducing about 15% also for total energy expenditure. And we can calculate the total calorie requirements through uh, many methods as I will say. Uh, sometimes we depend on our own nutritional weight. Uh, on the nutritional weight, which is calculated by uh, ideal body weight plus 0.25 multiplied by the actual weight minus the ideal body weight. Suppose your patient uh, weighing 100 kilogram and the uh, ideal, uh, ideal body weight is 60, the difference you have to the multiply by 0.25 will be 70 kilogram and so you depend on the 70 kilogram as a nutritional weight for calculating your calories. Uh, predictive, we depend on calculating our nutritional uh, calories uh, on uh, three methods, either the, either the indirect calorimetry, which is the most uh, accurate and, and the most uh, potent one, but it needs some machines and not, uh, not every ICU is equal. basic energy expenditure and resting energy expenditure, uh, uh, which depend on the actual body weight. We calculate through actual body weight, uh, such as hair spinning equations, and especially in hospitalized stress patients, also mifflin uh, equation in healthy patients, ambulating patients, uh, plus activity factor. Uh, also, Ayrton, uh, Ayrton Jones, one which is specified for burned patient and trauma patient, and the pin state equations in ICU where many ventilation and the temperature are available. Really, there is inter individual variability in, 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 in caloric requirement, and even in the same patient, from day to day, there is, individual, there is variability in the caloric requirement. And so, our patients need a nutritional, if you need nutrition support, you need follow up and evaluation daily. Uh, in direct calorimetry, as I told, metabolic card is the gold standard, particularly, especially for critically ill, obese patient, patient on ventilator, and you can find difficulty in weaning the patients. You have to use the indirect calorimetry to estimate exactly how much there is a respiratory quotient and how much calories we need. Uh, also, uh, the resting energy expenditure can be estimated through equations just from carbon dioxide production by multiplying carbon dioxide production by 8.19 and through where equations give you the caloric requirement of your patient. And if you have pulmonary artery cancer, you can depend, you can estimate also the oxygen consumption and through the equation ordinary one the ratio between carbon dioxide production and oxygen consumption, you can calculate the caloric requirement in your patient. Stress factors differ from patient to patient and according after I estimating the resting energy expenditure or basic energy expenditure, I can multiply by the stress factor according to, to the extent of trauma and according to the uh, uh, situation in the patient may be from ranging from 1.2 up to 2.1 or more severe burns and in severe extensive trauma. Uh, total energy expenditure in the first week for patient with severe sepsis always this is a standard standard calculation standard calculation. We have indirect calorimetry, we have predictive equations, and the last three we have the standard or empiric calculations or rough calculations. Oh, in the first week, we give 25 
quelle calorie verte qui est per day et à tout certi quelle calorie verte gram quelle gram per day in the first week. By the second week, we have to increase. And as I told before, we have to increase to up to 125%, up to 150% by the third, uh, fourth week. As you know, the anabolic stage extends. There is an early anabolic and late anabolic, and the anabolic state may, may persist for up to six months. And during this period, the patient needs nutri good nutritional support, especially total calorie and proteins also. Uh, calculating the fluid requirement, as most of you know, uh, is, is a simple one. First, 10 kilograms, 100 ml per kg per day. Second, 100, uh, second 10 kilograms, 50 ml per kg per day. Uh, more than 20, uh, 20 ml per kg per day. If less than 50 years old, if the patient is old, more than 50, we can add 15 ml per kg per day if more than 50 years old. Uh, second method, you can calculate according to body surface area, multiplying by 1,500. Uh, third method, one mil per kilocalorie per day, based on total non-protein non calories, plus 100 mil per gram nitrogen. Uh, Macronutrient uh, distributions after you forming your uh, uh, you calculating how much calorie your patient take. You have to distribute these calories uh, uh, 10 to 35 percent to proteins, 20 to 35 percent to fats, and carbohydrate from 45 to 50, uh, 65 or 70 percent to carbohydrate. And the, in this formula, not a strict one, we can formulate it and manipulate it, modulate it according to your patient requirements. Suppose your patient's COPD, you have to increase fats to some extent. Suppose your patient's in renal uh, the disease and he need to go down the, with, suppose your patient uh, muscle bulk is okay, good. You can decrease the protein content to some extent and so on, according to your, uh, to your, uh, to the condition of your patient. Suppose you find your patient exerting increased uh, liver enzymes after uh, four, uh, two, uh, seven days, eight days, starting to exert in the high ALT or, or uh, ST. You have to de degree, de uh, decrease uh, carbohydrates, maybe the patient suffering from hepatic steatosis and so on. Uh, what can we do and do not do with, through our nutritional support? Can we minimize the starvation effect? Can we prevent the specific nutrient deficiency? May we modulate to some extent the metabolic process of the disease? Yes, yes, we can. We can through, through uh, treating or managing our patient in, uh, in a good state in our ICU. Suppose your patient suffering from pain or from anxiety or from severe delirium, these factors will predispose to more catabolism and more nutritional deficiency and he may, may suffering from more, uh, from more muscle wasting. And so you have also to ambulate your patient as, you, as soon as possible, as you can. Don't leave you, uh, even with passive, passive exercise and as uh, physiotherapy, electric nerve stimulation, and, and all this improve the anabolic stage and bypass quickly the catabolic state to which the patient is suffering from it. Uh, cannot abolish the ongoing, but mostly, mostly you, can, you can't abolish the ongoing protein breakdown and wasting of the lean body, body mass associated with the catabolic illness. Even with your uh, protein support, there is to some extent uh, a catabolic state which is provoked or with it, running by the cytokine generation. So the only solution in such a situation is the treating of the underlying problem. There is under sepsis, stress, and then you have to treat the underlying condition to bypass this catabolic protein breakdown. Uh, recommend, recommended calorie, uh, calories roughly in the ICU. Most critically ill patients in the first week, second week, uh, so you can give 25 to 30 kilocalories per kg per day. And paralyzed patients and resting and concentrator, we can give 20 cal uh, calories per kg per day. In obese patient, body mass index more than 30, we can give 11 to 14 kilocalories per kilogram per day, but we have to increase the protein in such situations. 
glucose maximum rate of glucose oxidation is 5 mg per kg per minute. Yeah, you, uh, you equal 7.2 gram per kilogram per day. If you exceed this dose, you will induce uh, steatosis, you will increase problems in the hepatic metabolism. Stress gluconeogenesis about 2 to 4 mg per kg per minute is poorly suppressed by the provision of calories or glucose. And so you must consider this item. Very important why our patient exhibiting hyperglycemia. Although we decrease the glucose infusion, there is endogenous, there is endogenous stress gluconeogenesis, about two to four milligram per kg per minute. And so when you supplement your patient, or you support your patient with macronutrients, you have to consider the endogenous metabolism, the endogenous generations of glucose uh, from the other ingredient of the uh, of the body, as uh, proteins and so. Excess glucose, uh, you have to uh, take care, uh, lead to hyperglycemia, uh, excess carbon dioxide production, and the difficult for weaning, and hyperinsulinemia, and, the, and the consequently suppression of lipolysis and hepatic steatosis. Uh, recommended percentage, uh, about 60-70% of calories for uh, to carbohydrates or 20 kilocalories per kg per day or 7.5 gram per kg per day as glucose. Don't exceed this amount in from carbohydrate macronutrient as a source of calories. Uh, fat, essential fatty acid deficiency is made. Uh, we give fat to, uh, to avoid essential fatty acid deficiency. You can, uh, you can imagine the starved patient to develop, uh, develop uh, fat, uh, essential fatty acid deficiency within six to eight weeks. In contrast to the stressed patient developed as early as 10 days. Fat calorie, of course, minimize the carbon dioxide productions, and sometimes we depend on it to increasing its percentage in such uh, situations. Uh, fat excess fat may lead to hyperlipidemia. You take care; you have to check the, the high triglycerides and so on, even if you're giving uh, proper foods. Uh, impaired immune function and the hypoxemia very common. Recommend in starvation two to five percent cal of calories as fat, but in stressed cases, fifteen to forty percent of calories as fat. Limit fat to one gram per kg per day. Uh, proteins we uh, in ordinary patients uh, 0.8 gram per kg, and uh, critically ill patients 1.2 to two gram per kg per day. And renal failure patient or CRT need more proteins, about 2.5 gram per kg per day. And hepatic failure 1.2 to two gram per kg per day. And morbid obesity, more than body mass index, more than 30, we have to give high caloric diet, high protein calories about 10 calories, 11 to 14 kilocalories per kg per day from the actual body weight, or 60 to 70% of the goal by indirect calorimetry and protein from 2 to 2.5. And in bariatric surgery, gastric bypass, and so on, don't forget siamine, siamine supplementation. Electrolyte, vitamin, trace elements, we will talk about it in another lectures, and also you have to consider it and make your lab and follow it, potassium, phosphate, magnesium, at least uh, every other day or day. Uh, pancreatitis, for example, uh, we have, uh, if the patient in EBO, followed by volitional intake, early internutrition is advised. Early enteral nutrition in pancreatitis patients don't depend on TPN from start. TPN if the patient is unable to tolerate the enteral foods. Uh, type, what is the enteral formula? What are the types of enteral formula? We have many, many formula in the markets uh, and they classified according to clinical use. Standard formula for a starving patient who can't eat. High protein formula, which contains a high percentage of proteins for every 1,000 kilocalories kilo uh, for hypermetabolic patients. Also, calorie dense formula, which contains 1.5 to 2 kilocalories per ml for patient uh, uh, with fluid restricted deficiency. Some relative low in protein, uh, we have to add protein to some of these caloric dense forms. Uh, and there are also other uh, organ specific formula designed for patients with a specific organ failure as in immunity, 
enhancing the formula design, the two alters the immune function and reduce inflammatory response. And also I really, all this specified formula not advisable and not improving the, uh, or not decreasing the mortality. And pulmonary failure, they increase the fats, decreasing the carbohydrate. But I think the most important is to avoid overfeeding or uh, don't push too much calories for such patient. And hepatic failure, they, they advise to contain branched chain amino acids uh, more better than aromatic amino acid concentration to decrease the incidence of encephalopathy. In renal failure, of course, the formula contains less protein, less potassium and phosphate, but really not recommended all this. But it is expensive and uh, most of the trials uh, show no benefit from it. Immunity enhancing enteral formula, uh, which contain arginine, non-essential amino acids for nitric oxide uh, precursor, non-specific immune stimulant, enhanced wound healing, also glutamine for enterocytes and lymphocytes and the macrophage and improve gut barrier function uh, to decrease the incidence of intestinal translocation and sepsis and so on. Reduce infection complications maybe, but didn't reduce the mortality. Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids and omega-6 products also they may be important in some immune formula, but take care if you increase omega-6 more than omega-3 or the ratio disturbed, it will lead to immune suppression and may be used in post-transplantations. And so the accurate measurement of such, amino, of such uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids is very important. Uh, a diet containing fish oil alone, there are three studies, significantly reduced the mortality, infection, and the length of hospitals. I'm sorry for interruption, uh, Prof. I'm uh, sorry. We have uh, still five minutes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, still, we can have immune nutrition in critical illness. This is a summary for uh, the indications of it. And uh, glutamine not recommended at all. Uh, omega-3 arginine may be considered in trauma and burns. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids consider it in burns and trauma. Antioxidant vitamins, the trace elements may be uh, uh, in sepsis and the trauma and burns. Good luck and thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ansari, for this uh, elegant uh, lecture, uh, as usual. And there are some questions from the attendees, if you don't mind. Ah, welcome. Yeah. Uh, there is one question here from Dr. Adil. Uh, he's asking about, in case of necrotizing pancreatitis, uh, when is the uh, right time to start enteral feeding? And those what those? According to patient desire. According to patient desire. And as early as possible. Perfect. Uh, another question, Dr. Ansari, and uh, for me also, I'm uh, interested to know your opinion. Uh, we are, uh, during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, uh, patients and ARDS patients, we are proning some patients, and you mentioned that internutrition is not contraindicated in such patients. So, uh, do you recommend uh, to start enteral nutrition as usual with uh, during the proning, especially that the prone patients will uh, take like 16 hours in the prone position? Any precautions, specific precautions, do you recommend in such patients for the enteral feeding? Uh, proning positions in COVID-19, as, as you know, Dr. Sarwat, may be early uh, during the, and the patient conscious, not on a ventilator, and he can control himself, no problem for um, feeding. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, in prone position during ventilations, you have to give brokenetic and you have to advance your uh, nasogastric tube or feeding tube through the small intestine more better, and don't push large volume for or bolus uh, feeding you can depend on continuous uh, feeding. Perfect. Uh, there is another question uh, from Dr. Taisir. Uh, what are mandatory follow-up labs for patients on enteral feeding? A patient need every, uh, all the, uh, the, the hepatic and renal profile in addition to the electrolyte uh, 
profile to write profile especially or specifically must be daily to avoid the incidence of occurrence of refeeding syndrome, especially at start. And after that, you can depend on the other uh, lab every uh, twice per week. Yeah, you can uh, you just adjust on Saturday uh, to his day. We can give him a uh, hepatic profile and renal profile. Also, triglycerides or the lipid profile will must be done at uh, weekly. Also, the uh, estimations of the uh, nitrogen balance must be done weekly. If you have the machine for indirect calorimetry, must be done weekly also. Uh, and so there are some uh, uh, some investigations, and I will speak in the following lectures, inshallah, uh, must be done every week, and the other special electrolyte must be done daily. That's perfect. Uh, Dr. Nair is asking about the trace elements. Is there any important trace element not to be missed during the enteral uh, uh, really, 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 there is a separate lecture for trace elements because it is a long one. But, uh, but of course, trace elements are very important because during a critical illness, the excretion and the storing of trace element is disturbed. And the, the trace element, even you can't depend on lab estimation of trace element during critical illness because there is shifting from the compartment of the body from tissue to blood to plasma and so on. But the important one, zinc and uh, selenium and uh, manganese, all these are essential and molybdenum and chromium are essential for uh, management of critically ill patients, especially during TPM and the parental nutrition, not during uh, enteral nutrition. In enteral nutrition, the natural food or feeding contain already the trace element. And also, also in vitamins and uh, electrolytes. Thank you, Prof. Ansari, for your patience with us and for your time.